Hello everyone. Today we'll be talking about non-ion gap metabolic acidosis and how to manage it. In the previous lecture, we learned that there are three organs that manage your bicarb. Those are your kidneys, GI tract, and hepatobiliary tree. You can also get acid from external source like sodium chloride. So you divide your non-ion gap acidosis into renal and extrarenal causes. And extrarenal causes can be further divided into GI losses and extra acid. To manage your non-ion gap metabolic acidosis, you can do three things. First, avoid giving acid. You can increase acid excretion. And lastly, you can give base like sodium bicarb. Chloride is an acidic ion, so avoid giving chloride-rich fluid to your patient, such as normal saline. You can use fluid with balanced fluid levels, such as plasma light and ringer lactate. One of the important thing in non-ion gap acidosis is to treat the volume depletion if present. In the previous lecture, in metabolic alkalosis, we understood that increased sodium absorption reduces proton secretion in DCT. If your patient is hypervolumic, you can use Lasix, which helps excretion of chloride, therefore improves your non-ion gap metabolic acidosis. If you are lacking in aldosterone, supplementing fluorocortisone can be effective in some patients, especially with type 4 RTA. If your bicarb is less than 16, you can think about supplementing sodium bicarb. Just to recapitulate, increased sodium absorption result in negative intraluminal charge. Therefore, you have better hydrogen and potassium excretion. The negative intraluminal charge makes your hydrogen and potassium excretion much more efficient. Therefore, if your patient is volume depleted, most of the sodium will be absorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. Therefore, less sodium will reach your collecting duct. Therefore, you will have relatively poorer hydrogen ion excretion. To treat volume depletion, replace what you lose. So you have to know the electrolyte composition of various body fluids. For example, in secretory diarrhea, you lose around 20 to 75 milliequivalents of bicarb, while in biliary and pancreatic juice, you lose around 40 to 70 milliequivalents of bicarb. The next important thing that you have to remember is the amount of chloride present in any solution. Normal chloride in human beings is 105. And you can see that normal saline has 154 milliequivalents of chloride. So this is a hyperchloremic solution and can cause more acidosis. As compared to Ringer lactate and plasma light, which are more chloride balanced. If you're thinking about bicarb replacement, know the bicarb deficit. The volume of bicarb distribution is around 50% as most of the bicarb is present in extracellular fluid. And if you multiply this by weight and change in your bicarb that you want to achieve, you should be able to get bicarb deficit. So for example, in a 72 kilo person with bicarb of 10, if you want to bring the bicarb up to 24, your bicarb deficit will be 0.5 into 72 multiplied by 24 minus 10, that is 504 milliequivalents. Since you also notice that he has 2 liter of secretory diarrhea with stool bicarb of 50, add this amount as he is losing this extra bicarb to get more accurate bicarb deficit. So in this case, since he is losing 2 liters, he is losing another 100 milliequivalents daily from the stools. So if you want to correct this bicarb level from 10 to 24 in 3 days, you add the total amount of bicarb which will be 504 plus 300 divided by 3. So this patient requires 300 milliequivalents of bicarb so that he can reach from 10 to 24 in next three days. Always make sure that you replete the volume status as well as hypovolemia will result in sodium retention and decreased acid excretion and you may not be able to achieve your target. Bicarb come in 8.4% solution and this is at the concentration of 1 milliequivalent per ml it has around 50 ml, so one vial of sodium bicarb has 50 milliequivalents of bicarb. To make an isotonic sodium bicarb solution, add 3 amps of 8.4% in 1 liter of water. Here you will get 150 milliequivalents of sodium and 150 milliequivalents of bicarb with osmolality of 300 milliosmol per liter. So in previous case that we talked about, since you need 300 milliequivalents of bicarb daily, you will need around 2 liters of sodium bicarb solution in a day. So if you start him at 80 cc per hour of bicarb solution, you should be able to achieve your target. If you want to give oral bicarb, 
convert the milligram into milliequivalents and you can do it by dividing by 84 which is the molecular weight of sodium bicarb so 650 milligrams of sodium bicarb is approximately equal to 7.5 milliequivalents bicarb therapy is commonly used in icu floors and in er however you have to understand two big complications of bicarb therapy first is increased co2 generation in acetosis, if you give bicarb, it's going to combine to form carbon dioxide and water. And since CO2 is easily diffusible across the cell membrane, it can enter the cell and can cause intracellular acetosis. If you remember, the bicarb is a charged ion, so it doesn't penetrate the cell membrane as effectively. So if you're unable to ventilate and get rid of the carbon dioxide, you are going to cause more problem with this issue. Intracellular acetosis can be detrimental to cell function and can result in poor outcomes. Having said this, the jury is still out there and there are studies that have proven intracellular acidosis while some other studies have refuted this construct. In one study, they found that there was increased carbon dioxide generation by 40% when you use bicarb drip at standard rates. The second problem with bicarb therapy is reduced ionized calcium levels. If you remember, calcium is bound to albumin and in acetosis, this is replaced by the hydrogen ions. So there are a lot of free calcium in serum as an ionized form, which are active form. As your acetosis corrects, the hydrogen ions are replaced by the calcium ion. So your ionized calcium decreases and can result in problem with hypocalcemia. One of the things that some practitioners do is give bicarb pushes followed by calcium pushes and we'll discuss the physiology and complication of this method in a separate lecture. So whenever you initiate bicarb therapy, assess the risk and benefit of acetosis from non nan gap and risk and benefit of bicarb therapy. pH less than seven can result in cardiac dysfunction. It can certainly decrease the contractility, but researchers have not found any change in cardiac output despite low pH. Acetosis can result in increased pulmonary artery vasoconstriction therefore elevated PA pressures. Low pH can also result in blunted response to adrenaline, which is seen in pH less than 7.1. However, there are a lot of advantages to acidosis, which you have to understand. It causes vasodilation, so it can cause increased perfusion and maintain your cardiac output. It also increases oxygen delivery to the tissues, which is very important in critically ill patient. Giving bicarb therapy results in increased CO2 production, so you have to make sure that the ventilation is adequate. It can cause intracellular acidosis, which can result in poorer outcomes, and certainly it can lower the calcium and therefore can cause hypertension. In summary, most important management principle is avoiding normal saline and using more chloride balanced solution such as Ringer lactate or plasma light. Other advantages of Ringer lactate is it has calcium in it, so it can blunt some of the hypocalcemic response. Always treat the volume depletion if present and replace what you lose. If your bicarb levels are less than 16, you can think about supplementing bicarb. However, understand that bicarb use comes with CO2 generation and reduced ionized calcium. If you're hypervolumic, treatment is pretty straightforward. You can use Lasix that will cause metabolic alpha losses, which will counter your non anion gap acidosis. These are the references. Thank you.